Hello, it's Daryl here with a preamble before today's episode. First of all, thank you for downloading our review of USA v Mexico. We, of course, appreciate it. Uh, the thing I want to tell you is that the audio quality of today's episode is slightly below our usual standards. For that, we apologize. What happened was a bit of a technical error, 100% my fault, in fact. Um, so the conversation was picked up not by our usual microphones, but by a secondary microphone. The conversation is still absolutely audible. It just lacks a bit of the body, a bit of the bass that our shows usually have. We briefly considered re-recording, but we didn't want to lose any of the sort of uh, the spontaneity of what happened and we think we actually had a really useful conversation Uh, a lot of really good things about what went wrong for the US and what went right for the US came up in conversation but enough of the preamble on with the show Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. I am Daryl Grove and I'm joined by the man who just watched USA's 2-1 defeat at home to Mexico for the second time <laughs> with me. I was like, I did just do that? You but did yeah. just do that. It's, it's the second time I did. It's Taylor Rockwell. Hey buddy, how Hello. you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm weirdly still on that roller coaster where there's still... 40-ish minutes of, the, of that mm-hmm. game that are, one, really exciting, mm-hmm. and two, feature a really good performance from the U.S. national team. I think but so. it's bookended by sort of um, a mishmash of horrific tactics for the first 26 <laughs> minutes, and then that really sort of um, pop-the-balloon final couple minutes where yeah. Rafa Marquez scores the winner, Yep, right? So it's up and down. It's a roller coaster. I it think the only one that isn't a roller coaster was Christian Pulisic, but more on him in a bit. And actually, that's my biggest surprise mm-hmm. from this game. Is mm-hmm. I remember the first time Ren thinking, "Oh, he's underperformed for the first time for the US." And rewatching it, yeah. he's really, really good. Well, I think part of it is that we think he underperformed because we're just used to him doing really well. Yeah. And so, to I think when you see the entire team struggle, then he gets pulled down to the muck a little bit. Yeah. When you go back and watch, he kind of even when the US didn't have the tactical superiority or know-how, still had his when they would get the ball, he still had his moments. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so, obviously, we've already done our instant take, mm-hmm. our quick take, hot take. Um, we sort of vented our emotions there and also gave our first impressions of the game. Right. If you haven't heard that, I would recommend go back and listen to that because it will inform some of what we're saying yeah. in this episode here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, immediately after that, uh, we started getting some tweets from people um, who it turns out they were watching the post game on Fox Sports 2 which we yeah. didn't know was happening because we'd gone straight into the quick take hot yeah. take right yeah. and I think I'm sorry I can't remember who it was tweeted at us but it was essentially oh Klinsman's throwing players under the bus yes right we, and I think a lot of what happened in the post match press conference what Klinsman said and what Michael Bradley said yeah is a really good uh, lens uh, through which to look at what happened in this game, I agree. especially sort of first twenty six minutes versus the rest of it. I so, agree. Tell you, I think, I know I think it's also points. worth noting why, like how it came about too, because it comes about in the press conference. Uh, forgive me for interrupting. First of all, no, go for it. I was going to say, have you got Klinsmann's quotes yes, to start with? So, I, I yeah. do, but I think the question was, why did you go with three in the back? And yeah. his answer was, we trained that; it went really well in training. The key in that system is that your central midfielders need to get into these one-on-one battles. That's something that was not happening in the first 25 to 30 minutes. No Michael Bradley, no Jermaine Jones got into these battles. Uh, their, their players could roam, and that puts you in difficulties. It gave them their chances, so we changed it back. Yeah, so if you're looking for who's been thrown under the bus, it's Michael Bradley and Jermaine Jones. But the thing I didn't even realize like when we first talked about this is that that wasn't the question. The question was, why did you play three in the back? Mm-hmm. The answer to that, the answer that I assume Juan Carlos Osorio would give about his tactical adjustments was, we stayed at the tape, we saw they're trying to do this, they want this player to go here, we figured with three in the back, we could, like, he didn't give any tactical answer. Yeah. It was immediately, oh, we did it really well in practice, but these guys couldn't do their job, so it didn't work, so we changed it back. And I think there's a lot of maybe misinformation and covering involved in that one big quote. And if you did hear our quick take, hot take, uh, we saw that the tactical shift from 3-5-2, which obviously wasn't working, US had just conceded with 1-0 down, to 4-4-2. It isn't Klinsman no. heroically gets up from the bench, strides out and rearranges his chess pieces. It's Jermaine, when there's a stoppage, when Guadardo's down injured, right. um, Jermaine Jones goes over to the bench, starts talking to Klinsman, calls Michael Bradley over. Bradley is over and then gesticulating to Klinsman. And they, it's essentially you're watching them persuade him, this isn't working, let's go to a 4-4-2. I am now, after second viewing, 100% confident that that's what's going on. I think that that's the final nail. Because I think even if you go back further, you're right, he doesn't jump off the bench heroically. But there are multiple sequences when he kind of stands up. There's one where he really does do this weird, like, up, 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 up. 
and then doesn't know what to say and sits yeah. back down. And, and there's, there's another one with Herzog and Ramos yeah. uh, either side of him, mm-hmm. and they're telling him things, and he's like staring off into the I've, distance. I have never seen him. He's look, catatonic. <laughs> well, no, it's like I've never seen him look so like sheepish. Like his shul- shoulders are shrunk or like sunk. His like head is low. He's rubbing his hand. He just looks so uncomfortable and mm-hmm. so uncertain that I think he doesn't know what to do and is kind of freezing a little bit. Yep. And is getting his assistant coaches saying, we got to change this, we got to change this. Then when your two leaders come over and say, this is not working. Yep. And yeah, you say Jermaine Jones went over first, he calls over Bradley. And you kind of see a little like look on Jermaine Jones' face like, right? Like, this is not working. You know There's what I'm a talking moment. about. There yeah. is a moment. It's like uh, two kids who have been talking amongst themselves mm-hmm. about a thing they want dad to do. Mm-hmm. And then they've picked a time to bring it up at dinner. And then like, mm-hmm. one of the kids has finally been like, all right, this is the moment I'm going to say it. And then you give your sibling that look that's like, now's the time. Come with me. We're going to persuade him. But with like a tiny bit of like incredulity. We're going to get a new car. Well, no, but it's like, but, like he, <laughs> he seems just a little bit like Jermaine Jones being the he there. Sort of like what you said, like, okay, we got to have this conversation. But it's also like, right? Like, I, this, I'm not crazy here. Mm-hmm. This needs to happen. It just seemed a little bit. That dishwasher is broken. Yeah, right? Like, <laughs> like, I know that you think that we can, like, put the clean dishes in there and then it will still work. But that's not how a dishwasher works, Jurgen. We got to change it up. We got to change it up. Mm-hmm. And also, there are these new ones now. Yeah, and I think that you can see the frustration on the field in the form, like, I think you spotted that Jermaine Jones a couple times was having to run around and then would look like, you know, kind of that exaggerated yeah. arms out. And then even after the match, uh, more quotes came in from Michael Bradley. Yeah, and this is the, this is the killer. This is the mm-hmm. thing that makes it clear to me that um, the three five two was Klinsman's idea. Yeah. It was poorly thought out, yeah. poorly planned. And the switch back to the four four two was like, let's go back to the thing that at least we all know how it works. Right. Right. So what was it um, that Bradley said? It was in the mix zone, it looked like, right? Yeah, he was basically asking about like the tactical deployment that Mexico utilized. And mm-hmm. Bradley said, tactically, they do some interesting things. They space themselves out in a really good way. You have to have a clear ideas about how you're going to deal with that, how you're going to close them down. Because if you don't, then it's easy to get pulled around. And it's easy to have guys who step out. Uh, of one space trying to close something down, and that's exactly the space they're going to end up playing through. That quote came after he had already said, you have to have clear ideas about like, how you're going to deal with your opponent. Yeah. Um, and the really telling thing to me about that quote is that when I first read it to you, I thought it was Jurgen Klinsmann talking, and your response was, are you sure that's Jurgen Klinsmann? That sounds like Michael Bradley. Like, with no, with no prior knowledge, because... It's an analysis of what they're trying to do and how their tactics were working and why the United States is weren't. Yeah. And that's not really the way Jurgen Clinton works. No. But I think, it, again, it points to Michael Bradley doing his level best to not engage and instead say, like, well, you know, we didn't have a clear idea, and he lets that speak for him. Yeah, and he has definitely... Um in some ways, like, reached up from under the bus and at least dragged yeah. Klinsman down under with him so he gets some tire marks on yeah, him. Yeah, and, and... There is and, an element of him sticking it to Klinsman. And I think the, the... Because, again, Klinsman, I think, has taken revenge in that press conference. I agree. Because he knows that... He's got maybe embarrassed that Jones and Bradley have persuaded him to switch back from the 3 mm-hmm. 2 back to the 4 2 And so I think that's him, like, counterpunching in the press conference. I think, yeah, I think so. And, and like, I can imagine it... And these being, are kind of big conspiratorial things we're saying here, right? Yeah, but well, yeah, because even going back to that little like like the Palo at midfield, when Bradley and Jones clearly say we need to change it up, and he starts telling them like, okay, like you can see him pointing, and like, oh, he goes wide. They both already know, and they both just kind of turn their back, like don't turn their backs on him, but like Bradley starts adjusting his socks. Jermaine Jones like turns away and look, kind of looks at the field, and they're both sort of like, yeah, we know, we've done this before. This is what we should have been doing from the beginning. Yeah. And it leads me to, like, the best analogy I can draw with those quotes is that, like, if you slashed my tires and then I drove home and couldn't make it because I don't have any air pressure in my tires and then you criticized me for not having air pressure in my tires. It's like, no, you did this. Like, you are the one who made this happen. Don't criticize them for your tactical shortcomings, which is, I think, what this goes to because... If we move away from Klinsman for just a second to look at what Mexico did, yeah, they adjusted their formation what in three seconds, as Stu Holden adeptly pointed out. Oh, can we like sidebar? Yeah, Stu Holden is on point. Is on point. Mm. Yeah, he is like newish mm. to this. Um, what would he be doing? Color commentary yeah. game. He is like he is spotting things immediately. Yep. He is getting it in a way that I think a lot of other color, color commentators mm-hmm. don't get it. Providing real tactical insights in real time. Yeah. Right. Even a lot of like some of the good stuff that we come up with, we have to watch twice. He's yeah. doing it in the moment, and it, and and he's still trying to be professional because, uh, as I said, I think he caught the Mexico tactical adjustment that I think he said happened within the first five seconds that Carlos Vela came across and pointed out like five. He held up the 
the hand with five fingers, yeah. which meant they're playing five midfielders. But he waited until John Strong introduced him, like a minute into the game. Yep. And then it was like, hey, John, yeah, so I wanted to say, like, he was, like, ready to go, but he wanted to abide by proper broadcasting standards. When you think, like, how casually a lot of people watch mm-hmm. soccer, they won't have noticed that. Because especially if you're a US fan, you're not watching what Mexico are doing, whether they're a back three or a back mm-hmm. four, which is actually quite hard to tell sometimes, right? Yeah. Because fullbacks move forward and that, it's mm-hmm. hard to count. Um, that's really valuable information that Stu Holden is giving to his audience. And so we just want to tip yeah. our, doff our caps to Stu Holden. And it's not a lot of, like, when I played, it's not a lot. No, like, there's none of that. Here's my anecdote. It's, it's like, you know what, because that's a crutch. That's yeah. people's yeah, crutch when is. they and haven't got things to say about the game that's happening mm-hmm. right now. So I think he definitely deserves credit for that. I think Juan Carlos Osorio deserves <laughs> credit for immediately shifting what he wanted to do because yep. Mexico came out in a 3-5-2, and within a minute or 30 seconds – Shifted to a four four two basically. Yep. Um, and so re- the weird like thing they did was Reyes uh, would normally be one of the three centre backs. Mm-hmm. He went and played right back. So he's the one that's slightly out of position. Mm-hmm. And then Leun, who would have been a sort of left wing back, kind of played left back instead. Although mm-hmm. Leun sort of, I think wherever he plays, plays left wing back. And so he still ventured forward, but they had a back four. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's not like necessarily why I say he deserves praise is not Sorry. just because yeah, it's not just because like oh you went to a four four two like that's it's that he switched like formations so drastically so quickly and people more or less knew exactly what they were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I know that there was some conversation about how maybe Gio Santos was a little bit lost, but he never looked that lost to me. He he was finding lots of space to me. And you compare Mexico's plan B versus the (laughs) the tactics that the United States deployed from the outset. You mean the U.S.'s plan A? Yes, and and it didn't look that way. It looked quite the opposite because they looked so confused and uncertain about when to step and who steps and Mm -hmm. who marks and who needs to go here. No one, it seemed like, was fully prepared for this game from the U.S.'s tactical standpoint. And before we get into the specific reasons sure. for that, the specific examples, mm-hmm. I think it's worth pointing out or take, taking a step back and saying that, you know, for maybe six months or so now, mm-hmm. um, our sort of realization about Jurgen Klinsmann is that his coaching style is not to give specific instructions mm-hmm. about how the formation works and what he wants players to do. It's a lot more... Um, we talked about it being vague and emotional, right? It's about mm-hmm. intensity. It's about rhythm. It's about aggression. It's about nastiness. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think this is our bigger criticism of Klinsman at the moment, um, is that those things aren't enough to win you games. You, When you come up against a team that's well-drilled and has really good instructions and knows how to do specific things and can, for example, switch from a back three to a back four at the start of a game and people still know the instructions because they've had those instructions previously when you've done it mm-hmm. before and you've worked on it and you've practiced it, you, you're not going to win those games. You're not. And I think that gets to where I am kind of emotionally with this. I know listeners really want to hear a grown man talk about emotions, but I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> Just because it's yours. It is, I'm not going to say like every single game I'm on Klinsman out. I'm not, I'm not quite there. No. But I would be very much okay if he were fired. Uh, and I haven't been able to say that before, but I will say that because after this game, it's not just that, oh, we got it wrong, we got our tactics wrong. It's that this is the first time that I have come away from a U.S. game feeling like the head coach of the team is hurting the team. Right. And I think that they played... I do think that those players that we talked about made that shift. I do think that they forced a change into a 4 where mm-hmm. everyone is comfortable. Yeah. I think that I'm not... Like, I think you saw people... Running it a little bit when Josie Altador steps up to take a free kick, it's clearly Michael Bradley telling him to take that free kick, mm-hmm. and it just seems like the players out there are are good enough, but they need a coach to elevate them as opposed to try new stuff that's not going to work, and then yep. they have to pull themselves out of that. And here's the the big thing for me is it's not that three five two was the wrong formation no. against yeah. Mexico mm-hmm. necessarily. It's that. Three five two without too much practice, mm-hmm. right? He did say that they did practice it, but we've like, yeah. I think we played. 45 minutes in a 3-5-2 like a few years ago now, mm-hmm. right? That was the last time the U.S. rolled it out. Yeah. And without like lots of drilling, it was very obvious that the U.S. did not know, the players did not know their specific instructions or where they were supposed to right. go. They were just expected to go figure it out on the fly in probably the, the biggest must-win game in terms of uh, CONCACAF pride and making a good start mm-hmm. to World Cup qualifying. And, and, and I think that there's like some weird disconnect because I've coached 11 year olds and sometimes I have the attention span of an 11 year old and I know that I tend to drift in and out sometimes I'll say that much and I feel like you're in Klinsman like so when you coach 11 year olds you have to say 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 you're my uh, 11 year old right midfielder I'm gonna say Daryl when we have the ball you have to go wide Mm -hmm. I can't say that to you once I have to say it to you 15 times and I think that you're in Klinsman is of the mind of like Timmy Chandler when they have the ball here you go for it 
And Timmy Chan was like, oh, okay, well, where do I do? He's like, oh, no, you got this. Like, I feel like he just thinks that one <laughs> instruction is enough. And yeah. it's not like, that's the best managers in the world drill and drill and drill and drill to set their teams up right. Not, hey, guys, here's what we're going to do. You're going to go here. You're going to go here. We'll figure it out. Go ahead. All right. It's Timmy Chandler. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you mentioned Timmy Chandler. He is the perfect example of what went wrong when we went out yeah. in the 3-5-2. And not weirdly, it's not Timmy Chandler's fault. No. He was kind of hung out to dry mm-hmm. out there. And once we get into this, this is also the reason why um, Michael Bradley and Jermaine Jones were not getting in those 1v1 situations, winning those 1v1 battles mm-hmm. that Klinsman was talking about. Yeah. You you were the one that, uh, I think, you didn't you record did. on your phone and post a Twitter a clip? So people can find that. We're at Total Sox Show. Of Timmy Chandler, right wing back, essentially up against Tecatito, the left winger, mm-hmm. and Leun, the left wing back. Mm-hmm. And he's essentially shuttling up and down that wing, trying to mark both of them the whole time. But it, and, that, and that has a knock-on yeah. effect throughout the rest of the team, right? It, it is a weird situation, like, comparable with whack-a-mole, where it's just like <laughs> one Mexican player pops up and somebody steps, but then somebody else drops. And then it, it's Omar Gonzalez in the clip. It's Omar Gonzalez, Michael Bradley, and Timmy Chandler. Yeah. And they're all just sort of moving all around. And then somebody will step. But then they have to drop back really quickly because yep. they weren't supposed to step there. It actually it looks to me like a clip that's being went forwards and backwards, the way yeah, people are running does. forwards and backwards the whole time. But it's not. It's going forwards the whole time. And I think I have supreme sympathy for Timmy Chandler for yeah. that first 26 minutes because that kept being a thing. Mm-hmm. That he would all of a sudden uh, sprint forward and then have to drop back. And like you, you would routinely see the United States sort of applying pressure high up the field. And then after about 10 seconds, you'd see Timmy Chandler come running in. Mm-hmm. Because it was like, oh, right, I'm a, like, I'm a winger now. I have to get forward. And so it just seems like, again, there wasn't much preparation for him. And then it was sent out and figure it out. And then he ends up looking bad. And he ends up being the one that's like, oh, Timmy Chandler couldn't defend that right-hand side. And he actually, in, in some ways, he's at fault for the goal, right? Because it's Leun, mm-hmm. the left back, who strikes from the top of the box mm-hmm. uh, to beat Tim Howard right. to make it 1-0. It's Timmy Chandler who, when the ball pops loose, it's like the Bradley Dos Santos tangle mm-hmm. that you think Bradley's got the ball, but it just right. pops loose. It's Leun who's, a, who's able to run through, like, pick up that loose ball and shoot. Mm-hmm. Chandler's following him, but he's just a little bit late. That's why he gets a foot to the block, but it ends up just mm-hmm. deflecting it past him out, right? Yeah. But we wound it back, and we did what we do, and we watched it many times in slow motion. <laughs> and what happens is Chandler's caught between two men. Yeah. So as Leung goes, I think Chandler's gesturing like, has someone else got him? Because I've also got this Tecatito guy to worry yeah, about. Yeah. Have you seen him? Have you seen him play before? Right. And he's caught between two. So there's a momentary pause. Then he realizes no one else is getting Leung. I've mm-hmm. got to go with him. But yeah. that, I didn't want to call it hesitation. That mm-hmm. like check that he has to do because mm-hmm. he's got two men is the reason that he's not able to catch up to Leung in time. I would say, if anything, it goes from, oh, he was a little bit slow to react. It's unfortunate he didn't get a block to it's kind of impressive that he ends up getting even like a partial foot on the ball. <laughs> right. Because he really does have to full sprint catch up to a guy who's already at full sprint and ahead of him. Mm-hmm. And it is because he's got Tecatito there. Uh, Omar Gonzalez has shifted out to the right-hand side a little bit, but he's not necess- he's not marking yeah. Tecatito. So it's clearly going to be that as soon as that ball comes to the middle, Omar's going to shift inside as yep. he does. Tecatito will be wide open. So Timmy Chandler doesn't want to leave him, doesn't want to leave Leun. And again, it's kind of caught in no man's land. And that little bit of hesitation is all the time that Leon needs. And hopefully everyone's still following us mm-hmm. because here's where it gets like an extra layer of complicated. Yeah. This is also the reason why Bradley and Jermaine Jones weren't able to bust the middle. Right. right? I think we said in the quick take hot take that they were outnumbered. Mm-hmm. That's not necessarily true, right? Because no. it's Bradley and Jones versus it would be Guardado and Herrera, right? Um, but what's happening is because Chandler is alone mm-hmm. on, say, that right wing, and same for Fabian Joss on the left wing, up against two men, right? Tecatito mm-hmm. and Leon on uh, Chandler's yeah. side. Bradley is having to be stretched, dragged over, drags a better word. He's being dragged yeah. over to that side to help out with that market so that Chandler's not always two on one. Right. Once he does that, there's one fewer men in midfield. Then there's always a constant breakdown. And, there's, and, even, there's a passing sequence that ends up with Herrera where you see everybody shifts to that side and they, Mexico just keep passing the ball onto the spare man. Yep. They come over onto the spare man. Yep. It ends with a Herrera shot. And I want to say two things about that. Number one is that we've said they're in a 3 5 2. Uh, Jurgen Klinsmann disagreed. He said it was a 3-4-1-2. And that one was Christian Pulisic, who was given freedom to... I think he said, like, he was given freedom to run around and do whatever he wanted, Mm -hmm. more or less. Which means that that one extra man in midfield is not an extra man, because now he's running forward to try to put pressure on. So there's that element. And then, listeners, I know you can't uh, see my face, uh, but Daryl can. And Daryl might be wondering why I just grimaced in pain for three seconds. And it was because I just remembered the other conversation we had, which is that what Mexico were doing was the exact same thing that we wanted the United States to do to Mexico. Right. Like, the exact same thing. 
in our tactical preview, mm-hmm. which would have been out Thursday, mm-hmm. right? We said, yeah, Mexico are probably going to go in a back three, yeah. and they might go to that three, 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 one, right? Mm-hmm. Which means they're essentially going to clog the middle. They're going to give you the wings. Yeah. They're going to give you the wings. So why not take it and we'll go at them? Go down the wings, use your Pulisic, use your sort of overlapping Fabian Johnson, like get as many men down the wings, just take it, get it out there, burn them down there, use that as our strength. Mm -hmm. What ends up happening when you go wing backs, you only have one guy out wide. You don't have a full back and a winger, you just have a wing back who's expected to do the whole job. Mm -hmm. Again, that's why Jimmy Chandler is shuttling between two people. Because instead, Mexico now have two men on the wings. They flipped it. It was Mm -hmm. the complete opposite where they were beating us on the wings by outnumbering us and uh, taking us apart down there. Yep. And I mean, and it was obvious because then they had the possession, then people get pulled out and that's why Michael Bradley and Jermaine Jones aren't in 1v1 situations Mm -hmm. because all of a sudden they're in 2v4 situations Mm -hmm. and they are not the four. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah. Oh, it's really hard not to get too angry about it. Um, can we maybe switch to... We, we Actually, we can, but first, I'm curious where you feel about your Klinsman. Because I'm saying I would not be sad if you were fired, which is, it's a weird thing to say because I don't... No one wants to be unemployed. I'm sure he'll get a settlement. He's got enough money. But... I mean, Am unemployed, I being too hard? unemployed is only really negative if you're financially struggling. That's a good point. He's, he's yeah, okay. I'm pretty sure he'll get that payoff. <laughs> but am I being overly dramatic? Do you think that he does deserve some more time? Do you think he can figure it out? Where are you with your Klinsmann? Well, I think it, in some ways it's moot, right? He's not going to be fired tomorrow. He's not. Right. Like, um, the US, the next game is against Costa Rica. Mm-hmm. Even then, we're only two games into a qualifying as Alexi Ellis said afterwards, um, top three go through in a six a six group or qualifying group, and even the fourth place team gets the uh, the playoff spot. So it's not a realistic thing that you have to really think about. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to agitate for him to be fired. But if he was gone, I don't think I definitely would not be upset. I'd be happy that the era of no tactics. No plan, no like picking a style and practicing it until we're really good at it. I'd be glad for that era to be over. And I would love a coach to come in and be like, all right, this is how we're going to play. Give me some games. You're going to see me like get this style down and then we're going to do it. And I think maybe that's why I've gone so low on this is because I felt like that's what he was doing. Like it did feel like he had figured out four in the back, four in the midfield. We can adjust it a little bit. We can Mm -hmm. tinker around with that. It can be a 4 2 3 1. It can be a 4 4 2. Yeah. It it seemed like. Such a question is obviously important. Yeah. It seemed like he had kind of (laughs) figured out a way to incorporate everything he wanted to do. And it's a thing that we've been playing and it was kind of working. So then to just be like, now we're doing this now, but no real plan with it. It just, it's very frustrating. So I guess I'll wind it back a little bit, walk it back a little bit and say, I am, I would be okay if he were fired. But that doesn't mean that the Costa Rica game, I'm going to be looking for reasons why, oh, he got this wrong. Oh, he got this wrong. Yeah. If he comes out and the United States plays a cohesive, well-run game, fine. That's great. Jurgen, you're the best. But I'm just a little <laughs> bit worried that that won't be the case. Well, okay. Now is a good time, maybe, sure. to talk about our sponsor. Oh, yeah. Today's show is sponsored by Mac Weldon. Mm-hmm. Mac Weldon make men's basics that are better than what you are wearing right now. And the way we have decided to advertise Mac Weldon today is to think about the idea that you go back to basics, you get your basics right in a way that Jurgen Klinsmann has not allowed the US <laughs> men's national team to do. Right. Um, so if you're maybe smarter than Jurgen Klinsmann, <laughs> what you do is you go to MacWeldon.com. And you can check out uh, a website where they have all kinds of men's clothes with basics done right. All right, explain yourself. What do you mean by basics done right? Well, so your basics are Mm -hmm. T-shirts, right? If if you've got a decent wardrobe, and I'm I'm on the way. If you've got a decent wardrobe, (laughs) you've got to have like a good basic layer of T-shirts, right? Then you can put a shirt over the top of it. You could wear it on its own. It goes with a sweater. It goes with a hoodie, as Mm -hmm. you are wearing right now. Yeah. Underwear. Your underwear is a basic but necessary. So this, you, is, this is the thing. It's the underpinning of everything else that happens. So your like your England Klinsman's equivalent of Mac Weldon would be like instead of undershirts, here's a vest. <laughs> like like oh no, it's to go out. It's to send the players out with no underwear. Oh, I see. It's twenty nine degrees Fahrenheit in Columbus. But I like just think that he sends them out. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're right. Yours is better. Yours is better. <laughs> Just monocles and vests. That's all it is. Yeah, like all the really fancy stuff, yeah. but none of the basics. <laughs> but so 
Mac Weldon, um, they were a sponsor in the past. They're a sponsor with us again. Same. We think it's a good fit for our audience. Um, if you go to MacWeldon.com, you can uh, click your way all over their very navigable website because uh-huh. it's uh, it's easy to follow, unlike Plinsman's instructions. <laughs> it's not a website based on emotions. It's a website based on uh Clicking things, and then you see the image, and then you can look at that item of clothing. Yes. It's almost like it's been planned out. The layout was uh, was well thought out. It was designed. It was deliberately yeah. designed, not just thrown together. Yeah, so you mentioned shirts. Uh, you've got hoodies. You've got underwear. You've got socks. You've got uh, polos. I, I do love my hoodie. It's finally cold enough. I've been saying yeah. for like months, like, it's going to be cold enough soon. You've been waiting for four. Finally cold enough to wear a hoodie. <laughs> and it's a comfortable hoodie. Not going to lie. So you go to MacWeldon.com. That's M-A-C-K-W-E-L-D-O-N.com. Mm-hmm. Spell check that for me. Is yep, that good? You got it right. <laughs> and Total Soccer Show listeners can use promo code TSS for mm-hmm. Total Soccer Show. That TSS. You'll get 20% off at MacWeldon.com. Thank you to MacWeldon for sponsoring today's show. Indeed. Thank you for keeping it basic. (laughs) Can I pivot to something, which is, we mentioned this before, a lot of people have been asking us about the US playing a 3-5-2. We've always said it probably won't work because we we talked about maybe the coach is the wrong coach to play with because it needs a lot of sort of um, planning and detail. But I did see things tonight that made me think, this thing could work in the future. Mm-hmm. Like this thing could work if we really went for it. So I want to just take a moment to maybe acknowledge that just because this 352 was a disaster tonight, mm-hmm. and I'm not, I'm, I think that's the correct word, doesn't mean we can never do it again. And I've never felt this way before. And this is kind of, I feel like counter, um, counterintuitive given what happened tonight. Yeah, I think so. I, it's not, well, I'm with you, basically. I, I wouldn't mind seeing a 3-5-2 again. I don't want to see a 3-5-2 again with Jurgen Klinsmann in charge. Unless he says, okay, this is the new formation, and we're doing this from now until hell freezes over. Yeah, that's definitely his style. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think the only thing that I'm still not sold on is who your wingbacks are going to be. Yeah. Because I think Fabian Johnson is obviously one. Uh, I don't think that DeAndre Yedlin is capable of doing it. I really Okay. Don't. What about Timmy Chandler? I, I mean... It's tough to say, given After the performance this, yeah. tonight, but again, I don't think that's on him. I think that's on a lack of preparation, allowing yeah. him to know what his responsibilities are. Because a lot of it, to me, was also Omar Gonzalez. Mm-hmm. not sort of, And I understand, because he doesn't play in a back three. Mm-hmm. He's not comfortable leaving the center and going right. all the way out right, which is sometimes what you have to do as part of a back three. You've got to essentially be a right back at least for 30 seconds or yeah. so. Yeah, and I want to say, like, I know people have negative thoughts about Timmy Chandler. I know he has underperformed at times for the United States, and there are reasons to have been suspicious or questioned his motivations in the past. Mm-hmm. He is a regular starter in the Bundesliga. He is a key part of his team. There is no way that a player who's a consistent starter in the Bundesliga and is a key part of their team at club level comes into the national team and is just bad. Like, mm-hmm. that's not how it works. It, like, there are reasons for that. And maybe it's a little bit that he's like, Nervous, but I think a larger point is that he knows what he's doing at club level. When he comes here, he has no idea what's expected of him, and that's a problem. So again, it's the three five two could work, yeah. just a little more tinkering. The one thing and by I, a little more, I mean a lot more. The one thing I really liked about it, and it, actually, this doesn't have to be a three five two. This could happen in like a four two three one mm-hmm. type situation, or maybe even a four four two. Is Bobby Wood and Josie Altidore with Christian Pulis in, Pulisic in some sort of playmaking role underneath? Mm-hmm. Like I thought that was all wrong in the first twenty five minutes, but rewatching it. There were moments when it looked it looked really good. It was just everything happening behind that wasn't working. I mean, and, and I know we're talking about like the beginning, but I want to say it was it became very clear on second viewing that one of the main instructions that the Mexican team got was do not let Christian Pulisic do things, and they still well, don't stop Don't it. let him isolate you and dribble at you one on one, and he still ran past <laughs> And if you do, lay down and take him out with a football tackle, because <laughs> that's what uh, Salcido did late, late in the game. They did. Basically, Christian Pulisic robs Rafa Marquez, I think it was, mm-hmm. and then, or Herrera, he robs uh, okay. Miguel Herrera, turns, yeah. goes up the defense, and it's basically him one-on-one with Salcido. I think if the Mexican defenders had not been as fast as they were to get into support positions, it's a red card. Yeah. When he's driving at Salcido, Salcido's the last defender. I kind of thought it was, because I thought he was going past Salcido and he'd one on one with the keeper. I don't think they're catching him up. I don't. Th- I think it probably should have been a red card upon second viewing, because Salcido isn't trying to play the ball at all. He literally lays down. Like, he's yeah. just aware that if I lay down, he will run into me and he'll fall over, or I'll take him out. Is there an argument that it's a red card because it's dangerous? Yeah, I yeah, think so. To just be, form like a, man, a one-man roadblock. Because, well, yeah, but it's also dangerous because I think that if Pulisic, if he had done it a little bit uh, sooner so that Pulisic has a little bit of time to react mm-hmm. and tries to hurdle him, he's taken his legs out. 
Like that's what's that's what is going to happen because Salcido is not letting Pulisic in on goal. Yeah, and that means that he's going to do whatever it takes, and that means yeah, then you're risking injury, especially since there's no attempt for the ball. You're just throwing your body at another human who's running at you at full speed. And Pulisic, he goes flying. He hits the ground hard. Yeah. He stays down for a minute. It's a bad challenge, and it's because I think they were briefed. This is the playmaker for this USA team. They were ready to defend him, and they still couldn't handle him at times. Yep. So, actually, at that point in the game, obviously, we've gone to the 4-4-2. Mm-hmm. Pulisic is playing left wing. He was still kind of super influential in yep. terms of Mexico being really scared when he dribbled at them, and in terms of he would drift in field and make some things happen. So, I guess, actually, this is all separate to a 3-5-2 that could work. It's just maybe me being excited about the rest of the hex mm-hmm. with Christian Pulisic running at teams. We've got one player that everybody's terrified of. Yes. That's a, that's a really exciting thing. Yep. And he's real young and real good and real confident and real smart. And he has that physicality, yeah. even for how small he is. Yes, he does. He did get into some challenges later on. He bited off Chicharito, then he beats three people, mm-hmm. then he gets fouled, then Josie comes in and wrecks some people <laughs> for him. Uh, it, made, it made me very, very happy. Can we talk about then, um, mm-hmm. I'm, again, we're very confident that it's Jones and Bradley who yep. forced that switch to a 4-4-2. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about why that 4-4-2 worked and also how, um, how it was essentially... To, you can credit that that switch mm. with the U.S.'s equalizing goal in the 49th minute. You can and should. Because I think... I did and I will. <laughs> uh, because I think, first of all, to go back to the 3-5-2 for a second, I think the reasons why the 4-4-2 works is the reason why the 3-5-2 doesn't. Because you kept seeing... like At one point, we, we, we watched it and we we're like, what is he doing? Michael Bradley kind of has it locked down and Jermaine Jones just comes running over to try to help pressure the ball. Mm-hmm. And then he's at a position that he has to sprint 30 yards. And I think... They don't know what their jobs are because they're not used to it. When yeah. you switch to that four four two, they know we sit back, we get the two midfielders. As soon as the midfielders get the ball, we're on them. We put them under pressure. They can't handle that pressure. We win the ball back. That's how that first goal comes about. Yeah. That's how Michael Bradley's shot that should have been a pass comes about. It's robbing the central midfielders as soon as they come into that yes. kind of midfield area. And this is, I believe, it's what we talked about in the preview. We right. asked like Mexico like to play it out of the back. Right. Do we all go and press them? You know, it, like. Tottenham or Man City or Barcelona style, right? Do we go after them and just try and win the ball high? Mm. And I think we we went round and round a bit and we settled on maybe not, maybe we let them come a bit and then you sort of, like Colombia did in the Copa, mm. you load the trap, you wait, and then when they come into where you know you want to get it, then you pounce get them. And, win pounce. Them and that is exactly what Bradley and Jones did to win the ball back in the build-up to Bobby Wood's goal. And if you watch that goal, and then if you go back and watch some of the goals Chile scored against Mexico in the Copa America... There are strong similarities because mm-hmm. you wait, you put them under pressure. As soon as you win the ball back, it's John Brooks. Basically, it's a, it ends up being a bad pass that falls to John yeah. Brooks. And he one Caused time, by the pressure of Bradley right, and Jones, right? But then yeah. he one time passes it 30 yards up the field, bypasses Bradley and Jones into the feet of Josie, Josie Altidore, yeah. who flicks it onto Bobby Wood. Bobby Wood goes, and we get to a goal. Yeah. Um, and, and or excuse me, Josie turns, I think. Yes, and yes, plays Bobby Wood yeah. in. But again, it's that, like, win the ball back, get the ball up the field really quickly, hit them when they're trying to transition, counter the counter, yep. and you get an opportunity. And that's exactly what we wanted to see them do, and that's where the goal comes from. <sighs> Imagine if we'd had a whole game of that. I think that's what the U.S. players were probably doing. Yeah. Because you do kind of see everybody, even when they make that tactical adjustment, I think you pointed out that nobody seemed like, all right, yeah, we switched it around. Like, let's do this now. We know what we're doing. And I think that's because they were all like, yeah, this is what we should have been doing. We know. Like, we're going to go do that. <laughs> I'm going to go play left back. He's going to play right back. Yeah. You guys going to be outside. Yeah, we got this. Okay, now we can play. And there was, right, for this game, again, was thrilling for that second half. It was mm-hmm. kind of end-to-end. It was kind of open, mm-hmm. especially Mexico bringing in Herving Lozano, who is mm-hmm. sort of, seems to be the only man in the world who can uh, make John Brooks look like a bad defender. Yep. Right? He burned him down the wing. But Brooks was wonderful. Apart from that, mm-hmm. uh, so it's a lot of a lot of back and forth. But with the US, I think having the upper hand, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think with the US, they kept, we kept robbing them of the ball in midfield yeah. and then driving at them, and it was really exciting. And I think the US was smarter in their physicality. Um, there were definitely a lot of the you know, kicks here, and, and you know, a decent amount of yellow cards issued. But I do think that it wasn't quite the as we talked about in the quick take hot take show uh the instant take uh it wasn't quite that like smash him hit him kick him that we saw in the Copa america group stage it was some of that but it was still that controlled wait for them to come into an area where we have the numbers then put them under pressure and frustrate them a little bit and it did seem like at certain points mexican players had gotten to that level of like ooh, they're starting to get frustrated starting to lose their heads a little bit they're starting Mm -hmm. to kick out but then i think the united states ended up letting them off the hook a little bit one thing, um, I don't want to keep bashing Klinsman, mm-hmm. but the one thing I didn't like is the change he went for was to bring in DeAndre Yedlin 
at right wing. I, I didn't realise this at the time. Uh, essentially, he took Chandler out, mm-hmm. put Fabian Johnson out of midfield, back to right back, and put DeAndre Yedlin at right wing. And I think, I'm pretty confident, that when you watch that, the US's sort of um, attacking dominance mm-hmm. slows down a little bit at that point. Mm-hmm. And I really think that it's a thing where... Klinsman made that because he thinks that's an attacking sub because DeAndre Yedlin's fast. Mm-hmm. The reality is it's um, a not-so-attacking sub because it's a guy who doesn't have the technical skills and the passing smarts that Fabian Johnson did. And here's the thing. Right? We sacrifice smarts for pace, essentially. Yeah. I think there are reasons why it was a smart substitution. And the main reason is because you move Fabian Johnson back to right back. I think Timmy Chandler from the first half doing all the covering of the ground that he had to do and being a little bit like confused, mm-hmm. I think he was, by the end, pretty tired. Okay. Fabian I mean, Johnson drops back. He is it seems fresher than Timmy Chandler. And there's that sequence, I think it's the Lozano one that you just mentioned, where he gets it on goal, that uh, Timmy, or Fabian Johnson comes across, leaves his man because he spots a man, wide, Chicharito, wide open in the box. Yes. Closes that ground 15 yards, and he's the one to intercept and clear the ball. And so, yeah, it is, a, it is a good defensive switch in that way. Mm-hmm. The Johnson to the back defensive yeah. switch. But the Yedlin to the attack switch. That's the problem. That's because, and, and I think we were both sort of like, when we stumbled upon it, we both had just kind of assumed that DeAndre Yedlin went to right back. And we are like, yeah, I mean, there's not, that many, there's not much else he could have done because Bobby Wood's playing really well, Jesse Altador is, Christian Pulisic as well. Obviously, you're not going to take out Michael Bradley and Jermaine Jones. And then we paused and we're like, wait, wait, is DeAndre Yedlin the right winger? Because you've got Julian Green, you've got Alejandro Bedoya, even you've got Graham Zussi, who we know can execute the game plan. Mm-hmm. Like, those substitutions all make sense. But DeAndre Yedlin... I mean, his first involvement was, like, he gets the ball dribbled straight into midfield and gets dispossessed. And now, not only does he get dispossessed, but he does so in the middle of the field, Mm -hmm. where Mexico now have four players and he's out of position. Then he goes for the dummy that, like, basically rolls out of bounds because Fabian Johnson's never going to get to it. It was actually a good passing move. And, yeah, Yedlin, like, dummies and leaves it for Johnson to run onto, but it actually runs straight out of play. Yeah. And And so it was just sort of, like... This is, like your why is he your impact substitution? Like why is he the person that you think is going to help you get a goal? And then you're right. The answer is he's fast, so we can kick it long to him in Mexico. We're tired. Yeah. And I think that was the extent of Jurgen Klinsmann's tactical new when it came to making that adjustment. Is new like now? I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Sure. <laughs> N O U S, right? Yeah, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> tactical smirts. How about tactical that? smirts. Yeah. Um, I guess the one thing we should talk about then is the Rafa Marquez winner. Sure. The one that made it 2-1. Mm-hmm. In the quick take, hot take, we were, I think we had already, I think before it was on TV, we'd, oh, absolutely. we'd, we'd clicked with the fact that it wasn't Josie Altador marking Rafa Marquez. Mm-hmm. It was initially John Brooks mm-hmm. marking Rafa Marquez. Prince confirmed that in the post-match presser. Yeah. Oh, he did? Yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And then Marquez steps across the front of Altador. Yeah. And and uh, Brooks essentially lets Altador have him in a way. Yes. Yeah. I think he lets Altador have him without letting Altador know that he has let Altador. Yeah. Have him. So that is John Brooks's fault. Yes. But I also, think... it's Josie Altador's fault because yeah. he didn't react. And actually, we we slowed it down and watched it. And what did we see, Taylor? That kind of broke our hearts because Josie had been magnificent. Only after the corner kick has been taken, so the ball is like just in the air. Mm-hmm. Only then does Josie Altador take his hands off his hips. Yeah. So he is just standing still waiting for that ball, and he is definitely not doing what I think his responsibility is, if there is a responsibility. Uh, I know I saw on Twitter, uh, Matt, Tam- Matt Tamashevitz, friend of the show, a friend of us, uh, was very frustrated that there appeared to be no defensive game plan for this corner kick. Yeah. And then you can see it here that Josie is kind of marking space, kind of marking like the near post, six-yard box area, but makes no move He's to in a- the right spot. But makes no move to attack the ball, yeah. and I think is waiting to react to it. And so that's where I think he's at fault. I think John Brooks is at fault for, number one, not tracking Rafa Marquez and dropping off and then not warning Josie Altador that this man is coming to head the ball into the goal. Mm-hmm. But I think Josie Altador is at fault for not attacking the ball in the first place yep. and winning it and clearing it. And as we said on the quick take, hot take, the one man that's not at fault is Rafa Marquez. Cool. It's a really good, just sort of simple but smart um, yep. move in the box mm-hmm. to come and meet that meet that corner, and then it's a really good like, flick header to the far post. And I think... Got to credit, got to credit him. And if he doesn't score that goal, I think he comes in for a lot of criticism. Because yeah. it, in the lead up to this game, I listened to Tom Marshall and a couple other podcasts, and there was a lot of talk about how he's old, he can be a little bit fiery, he's going to make some mistakes. And we saw, like, there was the one where Michael Bradley... Again, we talked about this, where, where Michael Bradley probably should have passed to Bobby Wood. Yes. Bobby Wood was wide open. But that comes about because Rafa Marquez is a little bit slow in possession in midfield... Michael Bradley sprints 15, 20 yards, gets around the referee to close down, and then wins the ball off Rafa Marquez. And there was a few different times that he was dispossessed. And I think 
that is the narrative of this game. Oh, and we did. Until he scores the header. Just to switch to that for a second, we did have the answer why Michael Bradley doesn't we pass did. to Bobby. That's Wood. right. Or rather, you have the answer. Well, I think it's basically when Michael Bradley wins that ball, he drives at goal and he lays it to Bobby Wood, and Bobby Wood passes it back to him. And when Bobby Wood passes it back, he has to do so at like kind of spinning around, and he like is very much off balance. And mm-hmm. I think when Bradley gets the ball, he looks up to see if the pass is on. And Wood is still kind of completing his 360 he's rotation. He's Bobby Wood spinning in a circle. And he's like, right. oh, he's not going to be ready. He's probably going to fall over because yeah. it looks like Bobby Wood's going to fall over. Clearly, he's got some ballet background because he's got that, <laughs> that good center of gravity. But I, I, think, I have tickets to see me in the Nutcracker this Christmas. <laughs> That'll do it. That seems like <laughs> a, an apt title. Um, and so I think then Bradley thinks Wood's going to fall down. He's not going to be ready. And then he puts his head down. And by the time yeah. he puts his head down to shoot, Bobby Wood has gotten into the position yeah. where it's like, no, now I'm ready. Oh, you've already shot. Mm-hmm. So... It doesn't really let Bradley off the hook because a little more patience and maybe a little more awareness. He scores yeah. that ball. Bobby Wood maybe gets a goal. Yeah. But he did also create that opportunity more By or less single footedly. So yeah. single footedly, I guess, yeah. would be the more apt uh, <laughs> descriptor. Um, so I don't know. After rewatching this, mm-hmm. I'm obviously very disappointed that the U.S. lost. I'm very disappointed with um, the way Klinsman started this game tactically the way he ended it with that Yedlin sub that I think maybe took the fire out of the US, the way he threw his players under the bus when it was his fault yes. um, in the press conference. I'm mad about all that stuff. But there is still that 45-minute period, 43-minute period, mm-hmm. where the US was really, really good and I was really proud of them and really excited for the rest of the Hex. And I think that's the feeling I want to hold on to. Yeah. You're uh, not quite with me? Uh, I think I am. I think I, I think I am with you. I think it's just that the words that are still with me that kind of sting um, was Juan Carlos Osorio was asked, like, you know, how do you think you guys got this result? This historical result, you broke Dos Acero, you came to uh, Columbus, you made it happen. Like, what's the special secret? And his response was, there is no magic formula, it's just planning and work. And it's, it's just sort of like, <laughs> yeah, that's the answer. And it's not, because I do My think... My heart just broke a little bit. Right? Because I, I'm not saying that Klinsman thinks it's like a magic formula, but I think Klinsman's formula is... Intensity and aggression. Yeah, intensity and aggression, and we'll run him off the field. And when you come up against a thinker, which I think is what Osorio is, yeah. I know some people would disagree, but that's what I'm saying, I, I think that sticks with me a little bit. So yes, it's a very positive performance in the second half from the U.S. I think we were very we were very impressed. I was very impressed with a lot of the individual performances, mm-hmm. but that's what sticks out with me is that final quote. Can we talk about um, the end of the Dos Acero? Sure. Why is it the end? Is it because is it because we lost at home to Mexico in a World Cup qualifier in Columbus? I think in Columbus. Yeah. But does that mean that like the whole thing is gone? Like, with the next time we do this, we won't do it in Columbus? No, I don't think. I mean, I we shouldn't. <laughs> no, Columbus has been a very good home to the United States. Yeah, and, one result doesn't mean it's over, over, right? Mm-hmm. No, and and I think it, it, in much the same way that like the United States finally got that draw in the last round of World Cup qualifying mm-hmm. at the uh, Azteca against yeah. Mexico. It's they're not, not, like, not going to demolish the Azteca. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's also like, it's not like the United States is now going to go there and be like, yep, not intimidating yeah. anymore. Like, this is totally easy. Yeah. Like, it's still going to be just as, like, difficult of an atmosphere and, and it still in has t- that history. Two yeah, and it'll see exactly. And it has that history that, everyone will still be aware of. Mm-hmm. It still has that name. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Columbus will still have that Dos Acero reputation. Yep. Even the next time Mexico comes to town. But this definitely sets us up for the rest of the Hex. Yeah. With um, Osorio's reputation, after the Chile defeat, the yeah. 7-0 defeat, mm-hmm. I think his reputation, it's got to be mostly restored, right? Yeah. Winning in Columbus. Winning in Columbus is kind of like winning at the Azteca. Mm-hmm. Not as big. Uh, yeah. Right? Not as big an achievement, but kind of a thing that Mexico wanted to do to prove a point. So I will say this. So they turned a corner here. I think a lot of the media that I saw, a lot of the way this was covered, made this out to be an American thing. That the U.S. was the ones who cared about Dos Acero, that the U.S. was the ones who make this a big deal, that the Mexican team doesn't really care about it, it's not that big of a deal. But Mexico brought a sports psychologist with them. They did. <laughs> watch their celebrations when that goal goes in. Watch their celebrations after the full, final whistle goes you can find them on Twitter. Watch their celebrations in the locker room where mm-hmm. people are carrying Andres Cordado around because he's injured, <laughs> but they're so happy. It meant something to this team. Yeah, it it had significance, which is a bummer that now like the United States lost. And when they conceded that first goal, the first comment from John Strong was like, Dos Acero is over, or like for this game. Yeah. But I think the other side of that is that it shows how serious of an opponent the United States has become for Mexico. Oh, yeah, of course. Because there was a period... 
when we were a little bit scared. That it was like, ooh, this seems to not be going so well for the U.S. That Mexico are kind of beating us at every single level. It's not really looking as competitive. And so to see how much winning on U.S. soil means to Mexico, on U.S. soil against USA, it still makes me a little bit happy in the end. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there's still obviously much more hex to go. Um, First for the U.S., like I said, we're fourth out of six right now. Not yet time to panic, although it's obviously not a great start. Mm -hmm. Next game is Tuesday away to Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. Costa Rica have already started with a win away to Trinidad and Tobago. Sure have. They so sure have. it's Tuesday. I think uh, I saw it was 9 p.m. 9.05 is what I've seen. Yeah, <laughs> well, the key time is 9 p.m. Yeah, 9.05 is the official kickoff mm-hmm. time. It's on Be In Sports yep. in the United States. We will, of course, be watching it not live. We have, we have practice. We do have practice. We have practice, so we won't be able to offer a quick take, hot take mm-hmm. of USA Costa Rica. We will, of course, be previewing this game in depth on Monday, right? Uh, making some recommendations, which Klinsman will ignore, um, and then <laughs> reviewing the game uh, late Tuesday night or early yep. Wednesday mm-hmm. morning. Yes. Anything else to add, Taylor, before we sign off for the evening? Yes, I will and say... By evening, I mean morning. Yeah, I would say, <laughs> uh, I think Daryl Grove deserves some credit because I was very increasingly angry as this second viewing went through because it felt like this could have been so much better, everything could have been so much better. And I was kind of ready, I think, to be a little bit negative overall. Uh, still a little bit negative, not gonna lie. <laughs> but um, I think you made the point that, like, but look at the individual performances and yes. how some of these partnerships seem to be clicking. That Alter and Wood, Alter and Wood, and we talked about this in the Quick Take uh, episode. That like after that goal, you can hear Alter audibly say, "Like I told you, baby." Like it's like <laughs> yeah. you, you can tell that they have had that, that sort of rapport where it's like this: we do this and it'll keep working. You can see that people are starting to anticipate what Christopher mm-hmm. Pulisic is going to do. Yes, Obviously, Bradley and exciting. Jones have a relationship. So it's just nice to see those individual relationships. Yeah, Bradley and relationship is siblings and they conspire against that. Yeah, yeah. And it's just <laughs> nice to see that that the U.S. as a group of individuals are very talented. It remains to be seen if their current coach can unite them into a very, very good team. Right. We'll know more on Tuesday. We will. All right. So, Taylor, thank you for taking the time to talk to me three times today. Yeah. I mean, more than that, but, like, recorded three times today. <laughs> yeah. we, we're not just silent until the next recording session. <laughs> not quite how it works. Listeners, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for sticking with us all through the day. We will talk to you again on Monday with our USA versus Costa Rica preview. <laughs>